festival, a day or period of celebration, originating from the Latin festum, meaning feast. In 2015, I was given an RSVP to the Festivals of Faith. I walked awkwardly through the oversized hall. I felt small, almost insignificant as I stood in the vestibule. The color of my skin felt almost as heavy as Joseph's Technicolor dream coat. Here I stood among people that did not look like me and perhaps did not believe what I believed. I stood among world scholars, Buddhist priests, and those with PhDs. And I wondered if they could see that on the inside, suddenly I felt like that little black girl that just loved to devour words and loved to read. I, like Langston, was the darker one, sent to the kitchen when company comes, vowing that tomorrow I would be at the table. And no one would dare say to me, eat in the kitchen. Besides, they will see how beautiful I am and be ashamed. And then she said my name. Come, pull up a chair and have a seat. Come, let us reason together. This time the table was set for both of us to eat. Join me and we and us as we feast at this table of faith. A cornucopia overflowing with dialogues of race, gender, and religion. Suddenly my whispers transformed into echoes and my skin was no longer a shield, but a voice that shouted, I too am here. Learn from me and let me learn from you. So we dined and slowly sipped differences like aged wine, basking in the aroma, savoring the robust taste, recognizing how interlaced our lives truly were. Our insecurities were dissected. In this butterfly effect life, we realized that we were interconnected. We broke bread between us. We shared wisdom. We realized the life without differences was bland. Indeed, if we were the salt of the earth, it was our job to pepper the world with love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So our spirits devoured these nine fruits, speaking sacred truths among us. We savored ideas, consumed commonalities, begrudgingly chewed the bitterness of injustice, greedily thirsted for the sweet nectar of promise and better days, that we next share to place more chairs at the table for others to dine. Only then will we rise from the table of brotherhood together, better, enriched, enlightened, satiated, knowing that you, me, them, those, and all people will one day have the opportunity to feast from the table of faith until everyone is delightfully full. Thank you. Isn't she beautiful? Thank you, Hannah. And thank you all uh, for coming up on a Saturday morning and joining this conversation. Um, what we do, we do for you, and uh, this is just such a beautiful reflection of the heart of Kentucky. Other beautiful reflections of the heart of Kentucky are Misty Mountain String Band. Weren't they amazing? <laughs> Pam from Sweet Peaches making those beautiful muffins and the coffee from Red Roasters. We also are enjoying the handiwork of Hound Dog Press with your limited edition posters. These will be collector's items. Hold on to them. We scheduled this event at the last Saturday of January on purpose, and we do it to honor the birth of Thomas Merton, and tomorrow would be his 101st birthday. We choose Thomas Merton because to us he is the pioneer of interfaith dialogue and he guides the work that we do every day. For more on Thomas Merton, we have a very special opportunity at the Fraser Museum, and I encourage you to go and see the exhibit which opens tomorrow and goes all the way through the Festival of Face in May. Today's program is designed to give you a tasting of what we're going to be doing in May. What's unique about our program today is that it is world-class and homegrown at the same time. Our theme is Sacred Wisdom, Pathways to Nonviolence. 
and we will hear from some of Kentucky's most courageous voices on the issues that are most prob problematic in the world. There are many examples of tremendous suffering and violence every time you turn on the TV and open the newspaper. The Festival of Faith hosts dialogue that helps heal wounds, that helps transcend the violence. And more importantly, it lives, lifts up the rich diversity and the interconnection as a recipe of hope for the future. You should know that our 20 years of history with the Festival of Faith has not gone, gone unnoticed on a national stage. An article was shared in the Washington Post this year that listed the Festival of Faith as one of the eight top spiritual sites in the country. <laughs> Richard Rohr refers to us as the Sundance of the sacred. <laughs> as a result of this growing reputation nationwide, we are able to offer you an incredible, incredible lineup this coming May. Speakers, thought leaders, teachers include Karen Armstrong, Archbishop Kurtz, Arun Gandhi, Vandana Shiva, Bell Hooks, Jim Wallace, Pico Iyer, Alan Bozak, Ingrid Matson, and if you don't know each of these names, Google them. You will be blown away. So to kick off our program today, I am humbled and honored to now invite one of our most devoted attendees, as well as our honorary chair, Mayor Greg Fisher. He will share his personal reflections about the Festival of Faith. Thank you. Well, good morning to everybody, and congratulations for having the wisdom and foresight to be here at the kickoff of the 2016 festival. Uh, it's really been a great honor for me to be the honorary chair because I was involved with the festival long before I ever thought about running for mayor. And it's affected who I am and the way that I look at the world. Uh, the festival's mantra of Many, many faiths, one heart, common action, speaks to the very essence of what we are doing here as a city. It speaks to the essence of our city value of compassion. And defining compassion as respecting for each and every one of our citizens so their human potential is thriving, flourishing. It's an action word. Thomas Merton would say, respecting each and every individual so we see them shining like the sun. And so all of that came together when, we really, when I really started thinking about how do we want to be defined as a city? And yes, a city of lifelong learning. Yes, a city of health, but certainly an even more compassionate city. And of all the things that we've done uh, during my administration, the one that we get the most inquiries from around the world is why is a city talking about compassion? and the importance of compassion. It was interesting when the Dalai Lama was here three years ago, and he emphasized to me, he said, Greg, the world's religions haven't done a very good job of keeping us a more peaceful place. It's up to all of us to talk about these secular values of compassion, kindness, and love. That's the answer for where the world needs to go. And that's why you hear me talking about compassion every day, and many of you all talking about compassion, the founding of compassion at Louisville, all of this sweeping across our city of saying we can do things in a different way. When the mosque on River Road was graffitied, a thousand people showed up the next day to paint over the graffiti with love. That reaction had its roots in the Festival of Faiths that started 20 years ago and led to the compassion movement when there were loud, divisive, angry voices from some people that are masquerading as presidential candidates relative to refugees. What did our city do? We held a big rally and said, yes, we need to be a safe country, but we can be compassionate at the same time. So this work of the festival, uh, this work of our values that we're talking about, I think is the essential work to move the world forward right now. 
There's all types of people that are looking to split it up and divide us and create hatred in so many different ways. And they're loud. So we have to be loud. But our voice is one of compassion, of kindness, of love. Recognition, yes, that there are many faiths. But there is only one heart. And that's what pulls us together. So continue to support the festival, if you will. Think about a friend that you have that has not come to the festival. Invite them this year. Invite your friends from out of town. They will have an experience like none they've ever seen before that will open their minds and open their hearts. We're blessed to have the festival here in the city. Support us by buying a weekly pass that will be available here at the end of this week. And let's start talking about this festival, which will once again be the best we've ever had. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor, for your comments, as well as your example across the country. Our next guest is another Kentucky treasure. In the heart of Powell County, Kentucky, lies a beautiful wilderness retreat center. Furnace Mountain Zen Center, led by spiritual master Guy Gawk, sits in the heart of the state and emits this incredibly transcendent sense of peace. Today, spiritual master Dai Gok has graciously agreed to come here today to explain the significance of the Enzo, the Zen circle, or the circular image that we have chosen for today's, for this year's festival theme. Master Dai Gok will begin his segment with one minute of silence, which is our signature way to start each public event. We will be joined together for a minute of silence and then his comments will begin. The eye is the first circle. The horizon, which it forms, is the second. And throughout nature, this primary figure is repeated without end. It is the highest emblem in the cipher of the world. And uh, St. Augustine described the nature of God as circle whose center is everywhere and circumference is nowhere. So the, the circle is this dynamic energy of, of possibility. And uh, we use it sometimes as a practice, as a meditation practice of being present, the practice of uh, breath. It's important to breathe. Uh, important to breathe in general. I don't think there's anything that comes after that. I, I, had a, I was trying to find circle jokes. Uh, and it, they're bad. And one of them is, uh, um, and you don't have to laugh, it's that bad. Uh, why shouldn't you talk to a circle? They're pointless. <laughs> and uh, uh, everything in the universe is based on a circle except uh, Heine Brothers. There's always a line. That's all I got. So uh, when a, a temple is opened in uh, Korea, they uh, open the eyes of the Buddha. Uh, and the Buddha uh, is the archetype for the absolute or that beyond the small self, the uncreated. And uh, uh, so the, there's some uh, appreciation uh, uh, through this ritual. And so what they do is they draw an enso in the air, and then they open the eyes. So I thought it'd be fun to, to together draw an enso and open the eyes of the conference. So together, everybody, you can take your brush out. Everybody has their brush. Put a little ink on it. And we start right here. And make the enso and open the eyes. Fabulous. So I'm going to draw an enso, 
And as every performer knows, the 90% of the performance is the audience. So we're going to draw this ENSO. So I need your help, concentration, focus, so we can make it the best ENSO ever. And by the way, uh, there are no good or bad ENSOs. <laughs> you know, you have to, the ENSO has to find you in, in all of this. So here we go. Now, you can, some people are like really uh, clean ENSOs. I'm a kind of a, a messy ENSO person. So I like that kind of initial splash. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, it is now my pleasure to introduce this beautiful moderator who is gracing us today on the Kentucky Voices panel. Emmy Award winning broadcaster Gene West is the producer and host of this area's first and only local program devoted entirely to the medical and health issues of this community. With more than 25 years experience as an anchor and reporter at Wave TV and WHAS TV in Louisville, Jean also worked internationally as a reporter and anchor for the Far East Network in Japan. Her reports have appeared on National Public Radio and ABC's Primetime Live. It is my distinct pleasure to welcome Jean as moderator of this event. And then, uh, before Ms. West begins to introduce the panelists, allow me once again the pleasure to introduce Ms. Hannah Drake to join us with her second original poem written expressly for this event today. Incidentally, copies of her poems will be found on our website, festivaloffaith.org. She spoke at our festival last year, and we had numerous requests for copies of the poems, so we thought ahead, and they're already posted. Hannah is the author and poet who is frequently asked to speak throughout the country, offering inspiring messages of hope and deliverance. She has performed at various venues, including the legendary Showtime at the Apollo. In 2014, she joined Roots and Wings, a dynamic group of artists that seek to bring social change within their community. Hannah is the author of two novels and several collections of poetry which are amazing and will be for sale at the Festival of Faith. Once again, Hannah Drake. We don't trust love enough. We would rather reject love and embrace fear and hate instead of allowing our hearts to be open to the possibility that love does exist. We don't trust love enough. Trusting means to let your guard down to strip away your false securities, your judgments, prejudices, and reveal your insecurities. Trusting is opening your life to someone that possesses the ability to hurt you in all your frailty. We don't trust love enough. We are too afraid, too settled in our familiar, our comfort, and our convenient space to step outside of the known and dip our souls into the unknown. We are scared of getting to know others that do not look like us, that do not think like us, that challenge our long-held beliefs, our systems, and our policies. We are fearful of embracing our differences, failing to understand that it is our differences that are cause for celebration, for mutual respect, understanding, and growth. How different our lives, our relationships, our communities, and even this world would be if just once we decided to trust love. Trust that out of faith, hope, and love, the greatest of these is love. Trust that it is okay to love. Trust that loving can cover a multitude of sins. That loving despite hate is daring. That loving in the face of violence takes courage. That loving in spite of injustice takes strength. That loving in the face of hurt takes humility. That loving those that society tells you to hate is liberating. Love is a choice. 
Love is not always a life of convenience. It is an action word. Love is not sideline living. Love requires you getting in this game that we call life. Love takes work, especially when it's easy to sit down and say, that's not my problem, why should I care, why should their lives matter? As Thomas Merton said, our job is to love others without stopping to inquire whether or not they are worthy. That is not our business. In fact, it is nobody's business. What we are asked to do is love, and this love itself will render both ourselves and our neighbors worthy. Love is not weakness. Love is still right even when you feel wronged. Love is freedom. It is that quiet resilience in the face of opposition. Love, as Paul gracefully penned, provides us with a timeless, sacred wisdom. If I speak with human elegance and angelic ecstasy but don't love, I am nothing but the creaking of a rusty gate. If I speak God's word with power, revealing all his mysteries and making everything plain as day, and if I have faith that says to a mountain, jump, and it jumps, but I do not love, then I have nothing. If I, gain, if I give everything I own to the poor and even go to the stake as a martyr, but I don't love, I've gotten nowhere. So no matter what I say, what I believe, and what I do, I am bankrupt without love. Love never gives up. Love cares more for others than it does itself. Love doesn't want what it doesn't have. Love doesn't strut. It doesn't have a swelled head. It doesn't force itself on others. It isn't always me first. Love doesn't fly off the handle. It doesn't keep the score of sins of others. It doesn't revel when others grovel. It takes pleasure in the flowering of truth. It puts up with anything. Trust God always and always looks for the best. Love never looks back, but it keeps going until the end. Inspired speech will someday be over. Praying in tongues will end. Understanding will reach its limits. But love, in spite of all the finite things in this world, is infinite. Therefore, trust steadily in God, hope unswervingly, love extravagantly, and the best of all three of these is love. Thank you. Our first speaker, of course, is Congressman John Yarmouth. Y'all know who he is. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Represents Kentucky's third congressional district. Uh, he's been recognized for his work to improve education, expand access to affordable health care, and revitalize manufacturing in Louisville. Uh, we have also Brian Yanovchik. Did I say that right? Brian serves as the Senior Vice President of Mission Integration for Kentucky One Health. In that role, he ensures that the Kentucky One purpose and values per permeate the health system's culture, business processes, and health care delivery. That's a big order. Then we have Sadiqwa Reynolds. Sadiqwa has recently assumed the position of President for the Louisville Urban League and serves as its first female president. And before that, she served as Louisville Metro government's chief of community buildings, so she, she knows neighborhoods firsthand. And Christy Brown, of course, needs no introduction. Uh, there's the bio here, but what I'm getting, she's the person who brought the prince to Louisville. <laughs> 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 That's Christy Brown. All right, John, can we start with you? Well, thank you, Jean. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's great to be here. And uh, before I get started in my remarks, I'd like to take a minute just to honor the lifetime of Senator Georgia Powers, who passed away this morning. Absolutely. Um, for those of you who didn't know her, she was the first African-American member of the Kentucky General Assembly, was a pioneer in the civil rights movement in the 50s and 60s. Uh, a great, great citizen, a great person, and <clears throat> she will be sorely missed. So sometime during your day, in your heart, thank her for her life. I think it would be nice. Um, yesterday, we had our, this last few days, we had our annual House Democrat retreat in uh, Baltimore, and yesterday morning I sat down, I was sitting next to John Lewis, uh, who is an icon of the civil rights movement, um, from, serves, represents Atlanta, 
And I told him what I was doing today, and I said, can there be sacred wisdom that doesn't come out of a religious text? And he said, well, sure, if you believe that people are God's children and the ju God's creation, then anything that they might say is sacred wisdom, if it's wise. So <laughs> with that, I started thinking about the things that I can point to as sa what I consider sacred wisdom that inform my work. And the first one, part of it you're very familiar with. It's the words in the Declaration of Independence. It says, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We all know that. The next line is, however, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men. And when I think of the importance of government, in trying to achieve that equality of opportunity that we are mandated to do in the Declaration. I think of things like our work on voting rights to make sure that everybody has an opportunity to vote uh, and the luxury of voting and the, uh, the flexibility of voting, certain things that are still being challenged on a daily basis throughout this country. We thought we had all that cured, but we don't, so we still have to work on that. Um, also, campaign finance reform. You know, everybody has one vote, but not everybody has the ability to spend tens of millions of dollars to influence votes. So that's a, we have an imbalance there. Pay equity. You know, one of the first things that we did when I, I did when I was elected to Congress in 2006 <clears throat> was to help vote on the Lilly Ledbetter Act, which helped restore the rights of women to guarantee equal pay. And of course, we still have work to do with LGBT rights and with housing uh, equality and many other areas where government plays an incredibly important role. So that's one bit of sacred wisdom and how it informs my work. The second one is uh, something that Margaret Mead, the great anthropologist, once said. She said, uh, I was brought up to believe that the only thing worth doing was to add to the sum of accurate information in the world. <laughs> So as I um, go through the years, and, and uh, as I did with the Affordable Care Act, and try to serve as a truth, truth squad to all, for all the misinformation that's out there in the world, I remember Margaret Mead's uh, admonition, and I, I, I continue to do that. And of course, my work in journalism before that, uh, some people would say I wasn't very accurate a lot of the times, but <laughs> tried, tried to be. And the final bit of um, <clears throat> sacred wisdom, and this does come from a religious context, is the concept in Judaism of tikkun olam, which means repairing the world. And I know when the rabbi was going to be here, I was sure that she was going to talk about that in a, any very broad sense, that repairing the world can mean a lot of different things. But in terms of my work, specifically with regard to physically repairing the world, the efforts to combat climate change, the efforts to end the scourge of uh, mountaintop removal mining, and even to avoid situations like we now see in Flint, Michigan. Uh, we can literally uh, use government to help repair, repair the world. So those are three bits of sacred wisdom that uh, help me do what I do. Thank you. Thank you very much. We should mention uh, that R Rabbi Zeritsky, who is uh, scheduled to be here today, did have a bit of a medical emergency. So in her stead, Brian Yanovchik. 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 Yeah. I'll get it right. I practiced it. Uh, is here instead, in her okay. stead. Can you uh, please give us your thoughts? Okay. Thanks, Jean. Appreciate it very much. And good morning to all of you. I'm really honored to be here. And uh, as Jean mentioned, I'm sitting in for Rabbi Nadia Zeritsky this morning, who's a work colleague of mine at. Uh, Kentucky One Health, she fell ill yesterday and called and said, do you think you can fill in for this? I said, I'll be there anyway, so it'll be a real honor to do that, but I'll do my best to, to, to fill her shoes. Um, one of the quotes that, that she wanted to start with this morning is one that I spent some time reflecting on, and it came from uh, Thomas Merton, and he said that nonviolence, ideally speaking, does not try to overcome the adversary by winning him over, but turn him from an adversary into a collaborator. And I reflected on this and I realized that there have been points in, in my life where 
I've been won over by someone or some events who practice nonviolence uh, and were themselves in some cases victims uh, of violence. I grew up in a white Catholic middle class household and I was exposed to the best ideals of, of Catholic thought that were taught by the Dominican sisters and the Christian brothers who taught me in the schools that I, that I attended. And I was growing up through the 1960s during a time of unrest uh, about racism at home and unnecessary wars abroad. And I witnessed the ways, both violent and nonviolent, that people addressed those issues. And I experienced the dissonance between the ideals that I was learning about in school and the attitudes of people on the street, including members of my own family from time to time. But a turning point for me happened when I was around 15 years old, I guess, on a day that Martin Luther King uh, died. And that moment changed me, and I began to understand the power of consistent belief. His consistent commitment to equality through nonviolence turned me into a collaborator. The shock of his sacrifice pushed me into a very different way of looking at the world. And then several years later, I had a chance to visit the Holocaust Museum uh, in Washington, uh, D.C. And I learned in excruciating detail about the steady progression of hate that led to the death of millions. But what was most moving for me during my time in that building was to sit in the theater at the end of the tour and to listen to the videoed reflections of the Holocaust survivors, to hear about their loss, about the impact of hate, and to be overwhelmed by their sense of hope and even forgiveness. Those stories were, for me, a new form of sacred scripture. Uh, and again, I was turned into a collaborator with them, wanting to be sure that nothing that I ever said or did would feed the kind of hate that would create such violence again. These experiences led, fed my need uh, and my career choices to find work that would make a difference uh, for other people. And I found that work uh, in healthcare over the last 25 years. And particularly, that need is supported for me in the work that, that, that I do with, in my work at Kentucky One Health. Violence prevention has become a system-wide commitment for us as an organization. Violence is preventable. It's a public health issue alongside many others. And it requires us to look not just at acts, but to look upstream to what, to the, not just the consequences of violence, but also to the causes um, as well. And a couple of programs that I'm, that I'm proud of and I'm able to, to support through the work of others in our organization. You may have heard of some of these, Pivot for Peace, which is, yeah, which is a, new, a new program that was just initiated a few weeks ago over at University of Louisville Hospital. University of Louisville Hospital is our, only, is our, is our level uh, one trauma center um, uh, in the community. And it's an effort to, 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 to help those who are victims of, 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 uh, of knife and gunshot violence to understand how they can get out of the way of violence and perhaps make changes in their own life that will help them to step back from those experiences. A Rise to Safety is another program that focuses on domestic uh, violence prevention. And it's an effort to create a standardized screening protocol so because, because oftentimes, even in our, e, in our EDs, uh, we don't always catch the symptoms of, of, of domestic violence. And so it's a way for us to, to, to use a, a, a standardized tool to ask questions and to probe a little more to understand the experience of the person that's standing in front of us so that we can reduce the amount of abuse that goes undetected. And Green Dot is a program at Flagey Memorial Hospital down in Bardstown. Uh, which focuses on bullying and in efforts to learn how to stop bullying and how to prevent that from happening in our schools. Uh, Bounce is another program that's, that we're involved with right now and support uh, kids who, uh, who, who have been involved in, 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 in difficult you know, uh, living experiences in, in their own life 
helping them to find the, the capacity that every one of us has within us to, to overcome some of their own adversity and to find a, a purpose in their lives that gives them the energy and the focus they need to move beyond the, uh, the, the experiences that they have. And finally, PACT. Uh, PACT in Action is a program that, that focuses on teen uh, dating violence uh, prevention. Uh, it's a, pro, it's a, a partnership with the Center for Women and Families. Uh, PACT in Action, uh, PACT stands for Park Hill, Algonquin, and California Teens uh, in Action. And it's a program that, that helps teens to understand the quality that they should expect in their dating relationships um, with, with others. And so these are the kinds of things that give meaning to me in my work. It's an effort to, you know, to continue to, to be a collaborator, to create a more peaceful and a more healthy environment for all of us. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I am going to stand this okay. morning because I am uh, so emotional that if I sit, I think that maybe tears will spill from my eyes. And so I'm the president of the Louisville Urban League at a time in our country when really there is uh, so much at risk. In my view, it is as bad it is, as it has ever been. And what I know is that people who do not feel heard or seen or valued can become violent. And we, none of us, are born violent. These are things that are learned. America owes our community, the black community, something. Let me illustrate. When Trayvon Martin was murdered, I remember feeling so sorry for his family. And then I watched and I listened as this entire country, and it felt like the whole country, demonized that child. I remember that they went through his school records. I remember that they tried to figure out what was he doing what did he do wrong? And I thought about what it must feel like to be the mother of the child who was murdered and never allowed for a moment to be a victim. I wonder what it was like to be the father who decided that your son could go to the store to get Skittles and a drink for his little brother, and then have everything about your world be questioned. I wonder what it felt like to walk into a store or into a place and see other parents consoled when their children were sick or maybe had passed, but your child, you spend a year defending, trying to explain that he was not a monster that he was loved by somebody. What I know is that kind of pain can never lead to anything good. When George Zimmerman was arrested and rearrested and rearrested, I imagined that someday all of the largest newspapers in the world would put on the front of their pages on the very same day, we are sorry to the Martin family. It seems that your son was in fact a victim. It didn't happen. It is really not about placing blame because we have to move from that. We have to figure out how to fix what is broken. But sometimes America, 
does need to say, I'm sorry. And who is America? I'm America. You are America. And as James Baldwin once said, I love America more than any other country in this world. And for that reason, I will criticize her perpetually. We need this country to be as great as it can be. And we need all of us to be able to contribute to that. For the Urban League, jobs, justice, education, health, and housing. My 44 years of life have taught me that in fact these are the things that lead to reduced violence, that end violence, that save lives. There is no other group in this country less responsible for its existence or condition in this country than black America. And it is time for America to do more. And that is all of us. What I know is that Tomorrow is not promised to any of us. We all have a level of privilege. Some have more than others, but we all have something. And it is time for us to take responsibility about how we characterize each other. So for example, right here in Louisville, there was an incident after Thanksgiving at St. Matthew's Mall. I am wise enough to know that there was never 2,000 kids. I'm wise enough to know that there was never 1,000 kids. I'm wise enough to know that there was no riot. There is never a riot where glass to the mall is not broken, stores are not looted. It did not happen. But there is something about brown skin that America needs to deal with. The time for knee-jerk reaction is over. We owe each other something. An Oklahoma City police officer has been convicted of rape. He is a serial rapist. He chose poor black women. He was convicted for the rape of 13 of those women. And the Oklahoma City Police Department did the right thing. They investigated, they found out he was charged, he was convicted, he is in prison. But he chose the women because they were poor and they were black. And he knew that no one would believe. And in this time of 24-hour news cycles, some of us almost didn't even know about the story. What is it about our brown skin that never allows us to even be a victim under those circumstances? Why don't our stories make the news? I mean really make the news, like the bad ones do. We are not, nor have we ever been, what was least among us, none of us. I am wise enough to know that I need you. And I hope that you are wise enough to know that you need me. The path to nonviolence is to sit down together and to be honest about what is right with us and to be honest about what is wrong with us. We cannot be better if we do not acknowledge our past, learn from it, and grow from it. 
There is no space for blame, but there is always room for I'm sorry. America, black America, all of America, the path to nonviolence is really about truth, about reconciliation. There is an elephant in the room. We cannot ignore it. People who do not feel heard, who do not feel seen, have to stand in the street and yell that black lives matter. Not because somebody else's life doesn't. We have evidence that everybody else's life matters. But where is the evidence that mine does? The path to nonviolence is truth. I'm Christy, and um, I wish our seats had been reversed here. Um, <laughs> But I think what I'd like us all to do, uh, or certainly up here to do, uh, when I say my few words about my journey, is for us all to stand and to form that circle. So in just a minute, we'll do that, because I think that's what we're all talking about. And I'm, I just am so overwhelmed with uh, inspiration from all of this, from the fact that each of you got up on a Saturday morning and got yourself to hear is an extraordinary commitment. And I think it's a statement that um, says to me that Louisville has every opportunity in the world to become what our mayor just asked us to become, which is a more compassionate community, what our magnificent poet asked us to become, which is more loving individuals and therefore a more loving community. Um, and I, I believe that because you're sitting here. And so each of us are on an extraordinary journey. We were asked to speak a little bit about our journey, and my journey began in Frederick, Maryland. And as a little girl, I went to a cloistered convent. They don't really kind of exist much anymore, unfortunately, but these were nuns that some of you know gave their entire lives to their work of educating and uh, gave every bit of materialism and stuff up in order to have this vocation. And they taught us and they tried hard to show us by example that life was a vocation. And I have to say um, they were hopeful that I might become a nun. And that was made pretty clear to me from the time I was a little girl that this would be a nice vocation for Christy. And I did pray a lot about it, and I did think about it. And as you can oh, tell, chose sweet, that wasn't the right journey for me. And I, I'm so glad for the nuns that I chose that that wasn't my journey. But that word has always been deeply implanted, as I'm sure it has in yours, and maybe a similar word, that we're here to serve. And we're put here to serve, and I am so grateful for those nuns and for my parents that in fact they embodied that in me, or whatever the right word is. But I can tell that you understand that word because you're here. And all the thousands and hundreds of people that have been coming for the Festival of Faith now in its 21st year is another symbol of the fact that there are plenty of us that understand that and understand the depths of the word love and understand these words that I don't understand why we're not saying more, which is thou shalt not kill. I would like each of you, as I will do, to go back to my, in my case, the Cathedral of the Assumption, but to your house of worship, your synagogue, your temple, and ask your reverend, ask the people that run your house of worship, why are they not shouting from their pulpits, thou shalt not kill? Ask them to please shout from their pulpits in all kinds of different creative ways. Because when we, it, it's not until we stop killing that we are going to actually be able to have those loving, compassionate communities. We don't kill, I hope, or many of us don't, 
in our homes. We work really hard in our homes to have it be a temple of love. And that's what, that, that idea has to radiate out throughout every aspect of our community. Yes, black matters. Yes, our black communities have been discriminated against and we must work on that. But I'll tell you something that no one's talking about or very few of us are talking about. And that is we are killing our air, our water and our soil. And that, in return, is killing each of us, regardless of our color, regardless of our socioeconomic class. The rates of death from the unhealthy air in this community are extraordinary. The rates of, of um, uh, cancer, cardiovascular disease, um, on and on and on. I have, I have a sheet out here that shows it, but are extraordinary. So let's, each of us, have our journey for beginning today be that we're responsible. It's not the, it's not the congressman. It's not the urban league. It's not the uh, president alone. It's not our mayor alone. It's each of us. And find in our journey the way in which we can help our neighbors and ourselves understand thou shalt not kill. Thank you. Now let's hold hands. Circle. There we are. This is yeah. awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's so precious. <laughs> Our speaker. First thing that's so precious, I did not know that about you, that you consider it being a nun. That's so wonderful, <laughs> your inspiration, and yours, Trayvon Martin, that whole culture of, of demonizing a victim. Merton, also mine, and I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit more. And Congressman, the Declaration of Independence, what a piece of work, you know? <laughs> so, <laughs> in the truth of it, okay, thank you. What a piece of work. Jefferson was good. Yeah, okay, good. So what we've done, instead of taking questions from the audience, we asked three young people, three guests, to come up and ask questions of the panels, panels and um, they will introduce themselves. They're wonderful young people. Come on out, guys. Okay, we can start with you, go ahead. Hi, my Hi. name is Ramsha Nazir. I'm a senior at Kentucky Country Day and I'm very invested in social justice. So my question would be, what do you think are some of the reasons as to why some minorities in this country must face an equality movement or even an upheaval in some cases before they can be accepted as true citizens of America in the eyes of the public? Yeah. You want me to try? Well, it's uh, certainly a recurrent pattern in our history. I think every wave of immigration has uh, faced that same challenge of acceptance. And I think, you know, I'm not a sociologist, but I, I think you have, it's a natural human instinct to resist change. And I think everything that represents change is a threat to your comfort level, your peace of mind, your security. And, whether it's, and usually it's based on ignorance, of course, but we're seeing it every day now, the intolerance uh, toward Muslims in the, in the country, the, the mischaracterization of, of Islam. Um, it's, it's a very, very serious national problem, but I, get, but I think it's just human nature. And the only way to combat that is for those people who understand uh, the value of diversity, the value of uh, symmetry that we ought to speak up constantly about that as this community did as, as Mayor Fisher said and I was proud to participate in that on several vigils uh, back around Thanksgiving when we talked about refugees coming to our community and thank God we have a community that's welcoming uh, but but I think that's what it is it's basically ignorance and a, and feeling a threat yes Christy. One of the reasons that um, I was involved in the founding of the Festival of Faith is because I remember um, reading some words by Gandhi that inspired me about um, the value of, under, of getting to know one another. And um, I was raised, as you all were, many were, with um, love thy neighbor as thyself. And quite frankly, I always found that perplexing because I couldn't figure out how you could love your neighbor as yourself, like you hopefully love yourself. <laughs> That's another story, but like you hopefully love yourself if you don't know them. And so 
because I wasn't capable personally of doing that. And so that was one of the motivations, um, strong motivations for me to start the Festival of Faiths. And I think it's one of the strong motivations for taking advantage of the Festival of Faiths and other opportunities where we come together and diver uh, the diversity of our community comes together in new kinds of ways. Yes. I'll take a stab at that as well. I, I I think it, I, it, both Congressman and Christie said something that's important about it. And it uh, to me, it's about this our our problem with the other. <laughs> it's and 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 there's in a, in, a, in a need to get beyond the ignorance that we that we have about about one another. Um, it's been a it's been a pattern throughout our history, as the Congressman said. You know, the new folks coming in who become the the other and finding a way to create the relationship. Uh, among ourselves is, is really important. I think it's even more challenging now because, because we, we look, the, the, the new immigrants coming in, are, not only is, is there a cultural difference, there also is a racial issue, which we've had in this country for a very long time. And so it makes it even more challenging for us. But to me, I think what, you know, we talked about earlier in terms, of, in terms of that whole issue, it just becomes, it means we have more work to do and it be, we have to double down on our effort to, to get rid of the ignorance that causes the fear, that then causes the hate, that then leads to even even worse things. So, so if anything, it, it, it just calls us to work even harder to uh, to get past the ignorance that causes so much of the division. I just I think also that good people do need to stand up. It is very important for people who have the ability to do so, which is most of us to stand up and say something when we see people being mistreated. And the other thing is to change the narrative around how we talk about one another and one another as in human beings, because really there is always a narrative. And so we begin to believe the most negative narratives and separate ourselves from everybody that is different from us. And so, you know, it's interesting when there's a news story about someone you know, it's very easy to say, oh no, that's not exactly, I know Christy Brown, she's a wonderful person. Even if she said something like that, she didn't mean it. She, you, you would give her the benefit of the doubt because you know who she is and you know what she's about. But when you're watching constant media stream about this negative group of whoever, then and you, there is, seems to be no ability to say, that's probably not their whole story. We just begin to believe. And when you believe that something or someone is bad and everything and everyone who looks like this is bad, then it is so easy to demonize. So two things, good people need to do work, need to stand up for folks who cannot stand in places where no one will even know you stood. This is not about getting credit. It is really about how you save the world. And then the other part is, changing the narrative about ourselves and each other. And so many of the voices that we hear, that's all very powerful, are the angry voices, not the same people. So we need to be a little louder with what our ideals are. Jacques, you have a question. Yes, um, my question is, uh, I'm Jacques Barzin. Um, I'm 14 years old and I go to San Francis. Um, my question is, uh, where do people go with anger issues to get the profession to help and prevent violence? Mm, great question. Brian, can you answer that? Well, <laughs> of course I can. Of course you can. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, I think one of the most important things is, well, it, it, in a sense it becomes a, it's, it is a kind of a mental health issue. We think, we think of some of the more, uh, more uh, I guess, um, acute diseases as, as uh, related to, to, me, to, to mental illness from time to time, and yet our mental health really is affected by, by the way we handle our feelings. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I think there's lots of resources out in the community where, in, that, where, where that can be, where that can be uh, dealt with. First of all, understanding where our own anger comes from. You know, it, it starts with families, I think it starts in churches and synagogues. Uh, where you know where where there's, there's, there's got to be an effort to to address those kinds of things, but I think there's also a lot of resources in our community where these kind of things can be can be talked about, and um, and and addressed. But I think it's just a matter of seeking the right kind of help in the right kind of place. So. Yeah. And um, can I, may I? Yeah. Um, I, I think that we, especially today when we think about violence, we must think about violence against oneself 
and so much of that has to do with anger. Mm -hmm. And as many homicides as there have been in this city and in this country, there are, I believe, four times as many suicides. And so there, will n there are not enough resources around mental health anywhere. There is always a waiting list wherever there is mental health treatment. And so your question is a very good one. At the Louisville Urban League, we have added support groups because the community came in and said, we don't have post-traumatic stress disorder. It is ongoing. We are living in it. And I would imagine and I certainly hope that the people of Flint, Michigan, with the problems with the water and now the real distrust of the government, the, the credible mistrust, I mean, hopefully will have some sort of support. When you are so ignored and feel so unheard, that does sometimes internalize. And so that anger can be um, one of the things. And so I think that is another space for those of us who have voices to speak up and say we need more mental health providers, we need more answers, there, there are just not enough resources or even enough conversation around these issues. I have to say how proud I am to be sitting next to my grandson, <laughs> John. <laughs> but, I, I would... Um, I, I was supposed to be the one to out him. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I would like to also um, build on this conversation and, and your question, Jacques, mm -hmm. because I think there's a lot more that all of us can be doing um, to answer that. Uh, for example, I would think uh, all of our not-for-profits in our city have very vibrant websites and even social media and all these things I don't even understand uh, of ways to communicate. <laughs> and um, I would think that, that your question could lead to, well, why don't we do more postings? Um, why, don't we, why don't we ask that question to ourselves as not-for-profits and see how the venues that we already have in existence can, can be used to, um, to make this information more available. From the standpoint of, of the unhealthy air uh, in this community and water and soil, we've been asking at the institute that we just formed that question. How can we help each of us become more empowered? How can we help each of us understand what it is that I should be doing every day in order to help improve the quality of the air? So it's a really good question that we all need to work on, and um, thank you. Thank you. Just to add a couple things. One is um, we need our schools to be much more active in, in talking to kids about appropriate ways to vent their anger. We're not going to end angry. <laughs> angry is going to be around a long time. Uh, people are going to get angry, but it's a question of how do you manifest that anger and how do you, how do you handle it. Uh, we have now schools where there's virtually, if there is a counselor, the counselor is responsible for a thousand kids. Uh, there's nowhere near the time that they have to uh, to deal with kids who are trying trying to figure out how to vent. Uh, so that's one part of the part of the problem, particularly with, with young people. The other one is we have to we have to consider our culture and what our culture does to give kids and some adults uh, an inappropriate avenue to vent their anger. Uh, whether it's violent video games, whether it's violent television or movies, I mean, that sounds terrible. We don't want to, you know, I went to see Hateful Eight, uh, Tarantino's new film, and it's about as violent as it gets. Uh, but I know that that's not the real world. Uh, there are a lot of people out there who don't and think that's, an, uh, that, that's the only avenue available to them. So it's, I, I think it, it is something that takes a village. It's parents, it's schools, it's, you know, as a community, we ought to be running PSAs uh, in the media about how to, you know, violence is not the appropriate answer to your anger. It's ask for help, and it's also every citizen's, I think, responsibility to be aware of what's going on around them. And if they see somebody who looks like they're in a stressful condition, uh, offer to help, offer to get them help, reach out. Um. Kirstie, this might be a good opportunity to tell us all how we might kind of be engaged with this. We were talking, out of, I mean, I don't know if I'm talking out of school. What is happening the week of the Festival of Faiths here in Louisville that concerns you? Oh, this is very interesting. Um, yes, and I, I think it's quite miraculous, frankly. It turns out that during the Festival of Faiths, 
that very week that's which been is, set which is May. May, May 17th through the 21st. And it, um, it's been set for quite a long time um, that the National Rifle Association will be having the their National annual convention, convention right here, here with, in, Louisville. At, in Louisville, Kentucky at the same time. And so we would love your suggestions um, and everyone, our panelists' suggestions on how do we take advantage of that miraculous uh, happening. And <laughs> <laughs> the other, the other, <laughs> the other thing that let's write it all down so we can do it. The other thing that um, is uh, uh, worth mentioning in relation to what John just said is that we can be very proud, and we should all learn more about um, a, a new project that's started a couple of years ago called the Compassionate Schools Program, and it's in um, it's a pilot program for the country in collaboration with the Jefferson County Public School System and many others, and it's worth all of us learning about because it has interesting curriculum on early on catching the, um, yeah, the nonviolent. All right, great. Good question. Jane, can we, can I right. just say, uh, Kalia. Uh, yes, my name is Kalia Orr and I'm a senior at Liberty High School and I feel very strongly about education. And so my question is, how do you feel that the violence inside of our community is affecting our schools? Okay, who wants to tackle that one first? Well, I, I mean, there's no doubt that the violence in our community is affecting the schools. I mean, everything that happens in the community affects those young people who are in the schools and the teachers and, um, you know, everyone in the building. And so it is nice that we have programs and pilots like the Compassionate Schools. I think uh, we do have to think about what Congressman Yarmouth said and the, the counselors who are so overburdened with things like paperwork, trying to figure out how to get kids through and into college or whatever, that they're really not standing in that counseling space. So they hold the job title, but the work is really going undone. And so we are expecting miracles to be performed every day in our schools, but we are, uh, we, all of us, are sending in children who are hungry and damaged by maybe domestic violence in some cases. Um, I can say that when I was with the mayor's office, we established a liaison between the schools and the police so that when someone had been, a child had been exposed to violence and had to get up and go to school the next day, at least the, the school social workers would know that and be able to maybe have some mercy because you also understand that all of this is tied to suspensions and, and, and discipline in the school system as well. So we have really got to have some honest conversation about what is wrong in our schools, in our city, in our country. And um, I think, I wanna say this about resources. Seven counties is a resource in our community, but it is a resource whose budget has been cut. And, and we do need to pay attention to that. Paths to Peace, um, Peace Ed does a lot of wonderful trainings in our community. There are lots of organizations like that. But it is, it, we must acknowledge the conditions we are sending our children to school under. I mean, it is just so important. So I really appreciate the question. I don't think there is any one answer. Um, you know, just imagine that we are practicing lockdowns in schools. I mean, my daughter came home from the Brown School and said, we had a lockdown practice today. Two weeks ago, the parents received a note that said, take a chance, you know, you can send your kids to school, we'll be open, but there's a threat, right? And that was citywide, there is a threat. And parents had to weigh, will I be afraid or will I do what is right? And so, you know, I'm, or that's a judgment on my part. But anyway, <laughs> um, so I think we do have to think about the violence. So Brian, I also think the Pivot to Peace program also might be a component to I work on that. I was, I was gonna uh, right. jump in with that. We have, there are some programs that engage uh, young folks in, in, in school settings to, uh, to enter into dialogue around, around how better handle, everybody's gonna en end up with conflicts in their lives in one way or another. We live with that almost every single day. The choice that we make for how to deal with that is really the key. And um, so I, my, as, as I thought about your question, I thought about schools Yes, they're, they're, people bring into school what they live with every day at home, but it's also an opportunity, I think, within, within the schools to, um, to create something different and, and, and to help 
the, the kids who go there to realize that that doesn't have to be all there is. So I think the way the, way the teachers engage uh, their, their, their students, the way students engage one another, it's another opportunity for us to learn. I think some of the programs that Jean just mentioned that our own systems supports are ways for us to, to kind of create a vision for something better. You can't always go home to something better, but you can, you can grow towards something better and, make, and help people make better choices. And I think that's what we try to do with some of the programs that we're offering in our schools now. Yes. I, I'd like to flip it. I would like to say to the students here and the, all that you represent, you help us find the answers because you you have the answers you have the answers in your hearts and in your minds and quite frankly some of this problem that's going on is going on because we didn't have the answers or we didn't look for the solutions at the right time so I would like you to let's we'll help you how can we help you how can the festival help you and, and the congressman and all of us help you become more empowered because that you have, you're, you're the solution. And, yeah. and, you know, I have to give a shout out to these young people. This is where it starts. And congratulations, you, you all three. We have two seniors, okay? We need to like give a little bit about them. Yeah, <laughs> graduating, and you are on your way to, you hope, the University of, uh, you can give your mic, yeah, yeah. And you plan to study. Um, hi, so once again, Ramsha Nazir. Um, I plan to study economics and political science in the University of Chicago in this upcoming fall. All right. Wow. Um, well, I either want to go to EKU or U of L, and I want to get a master's degree in psychology. And, and Ariane. Ariane Jha is in seventh grade, and he is the son of the United States Ambassador to the Court of St. James in, in London, Matthew Barzan, but continuing the family tradition of service to the community. Jacques? Um, so you're not a senior, you're not going to college. But no. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for being here. And what's your assessment? Can you give us an idea of, of uh, what, what you learned here today? Um, let's see. Uh, I hate putting kids on the spot like that. <laughs> Don't you? <laughs> um, I think just thinking about violence and not letting it just go through, but really thinking about it and seeing what it does to the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you all so much. Um, I just, just to wrap up, I have to tell you, and, and everybody has different... Uh, things that kind of inspired them. My newest inspiration was last Sunday when I opened the newspaper and there was an editorial by Father George Kilgore. Did you see this? On Thomas Merton's connection to the civil rights and, and there were some things that he wrote that I was not aware of. And I just, and since we're celebrating Merton's 101st uh, birthday, I want to just read some quotes from that piece. He said, and this apparently in the wake of Martin Luther King Jr.'s August 1963 letter from a Birmingham jail, Merton, again, apparently composed his own letters to a white liberal. And I'm reading, quote, if the Negro, as he actually is, this is 1963, enters wholly into white society, then that society is going to be radically changed. Not only will there be radical change, but also there will be enormous difficulties and sacrifices demanded of everyone, especially the whites. Obviously, property values will be affected. The approach of the coming crucial labor and economic problems will be even more anguished than we have feared." End quote. And another quote that I really want to end with, he says, quote, we must dare pay the dolorous price of change to grow into a new society. Nothing else will suffice, end quote. Thank you all for coming. Thank you very much. <laughs>